Hey guys, today we're talking about what everybody's missing about Biden's infamous speech, the Fed's plan to start censoring our food, and Americans rejecting Biden's student loan bailout once they understand it. Let's jump into it. So guys, I've got Jack with me today. Hannah is out and about in the world. Uh, so Jack's filling in. Uh, Jack, what's new with you? Have you been to any fine cultural events yes, lately? Yes, I've been to many fine cultural events over the weekend. I watched a lot of wrestling pay-per-views and uh, other things that are very highbrow and enrich my life in multiple ways. <laughs> Yeah, so for folks that don't know, Jack is a big WWE fan. Uh, and so answer the age-old question, is it fake? Well, is gymnastics fake? They know what they're going to do before they do it, but people enjoy it and they rate it, right? They get injured, they're athletic. Um, so it's predetermined, but I think most wrestlers, especially our Franklin Jacobs, would be very upset if you called it fake, given the uh, the aches and pains that they've suffered their entire lives. <laughs> Well, and maybe this will get me canceled, but I remember playing the video game version uh, as a child and you'd like smash them with the chairs over their head or whatever. And I, what I used to find the most entertaining were two things, taking the women and making the women fight right. each other. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, they had midgets. Yes. Yeah. They had <laughs> making the midgets fight each other. Used to give 10 year old me endless entertainment yes and uh you know people uh, little people is the the preferred term and i respect that but i gotta tell you as a wrestling fan who's watched midget wrestling many times those wrestlers those little people prefer to be called midgets in the wrestling field they are midget wrestlers and they're proud of that term so sort of a unique thing yeah i don't get why it would really be that offensive a term it just is what it is no shade to the midgets out there uh, I think y- y'all are make for great wrestlers. Uh, so <laughs> in terms of what's new with me, not a whole lot. I, uh, I just started wa- watching this documentary called Welcome to Wrexham. So it, this might interest you. It might not. It, it, some people might find it interesting. Some might not. But basically Ryan Reynolds and then this other celebrity dude from It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia teamed up and they bought a a soccer team in England that's in the fifth division. So imagine like the equivalent of someone buying not even a minor leagues baseball team, but like two leagues below that. Um, However, the difference is that in England, in soccer, you can move up and down the leagues. It's called promotion and relegation. And so... That's what makes it super cool is you can start out as like a D-League team in basketball, right? A second tier team. But then if you finish first place, the next season you move up and you're in the NBA. And the teams that finished bottom in the NBA move down and go to the D-League. That's how soccer works in England. So essentially these two celebrities bought this tiny little hometown club in the fifth division in Wrexham in Wales. And they're going to pour millions of dollars into it and try to make it into a top division club and get and work it up the ranks. And they're doing a documentary that's being released, released on Hulu. And it's really great as a soccer fan. But it's also really, it's really cool because it takes place during 2020 is when they did this. And they're showing the hardship of this, this small community in Wales and how like the local soccer team is kind of everything to them and how the pub is closed. They can't go to, to see the team in the stands, but it shows them huddling around outside around a TV. Like you just get this human, the documentary is so well done to show what it means to people. And they're even talking, and I don't think this is meant to be political, but they're talking about how harmful it is that they can't go see the team in the stadium. They're like, it's not just entertainment. Sure. This is this gives people something in their life to look forward to, to take their minds off things, to feel part of a community. Anyway, it's super well done. It's super interesting for the soccer fans out there. It's called Welcome to Wrexham. But back in Welcome to Reality, uh, we have a big speech to discuss. You've probably heard people analyze or talk about Biden's speech from last week about fascism and democracy ad nauseum. 
But Jack and I wanted to still talk about it because we have some different thoughts and we're going to try to focus on the substance of what Biden had to say. Because yes, the, he, he spoke and there was this creepy red background and there were Marines lined up behind him and the whole thing gave kind of Sith Lord vibes. And that's what a lot of people have talked about. And I agree that that's silly, but it's also not super substantive. So first, let's just play our, our first clip. Donald Trump and the MAGA Republicans represent an extremism that threatens the very foundations of our republic. Now, I want to be very clear, very clear up front. <clears throat> not every Republican, not even the majority of Republicans are MAGA Republicans. Not every Republican embraces their extreme ideology. I know, because I've been able to work with these mainstream Republicans. But there's no question that the Republican Party today is dominated, driven, and intimidated by Donald Trump and the MAGA Republicans. And that is a threat to this country. These are hard things. But I'm an American president, not a president of red America, blue America, but of all America. And I believe it's my duty my duty to love with you, to tell the truth, no matter how difficult, no matter how painful. And here, in my view, is what is true. MAGA Republicans do not respect the Constitution. They do not believe in the rule of law. They do not recognize the will of the people. They refuse to accept the results of a free election. And they're working right now, as I speak, in state after state, to give power to decide elections in America to partisans and cronies, empowering election deniers to undermine democracy itself. MAGA forces are determined to take this country backwards, backwards to an America where there is no right to choose, no right to privacy, no right to contraception, no right to marry who you love, they promote authoritarian leaders, and they fan the flames of political violence that are a threat to our personal rights, to the pursuit of justice, to the rule of law, to the very soul of this country. Jack, I'll just, I'll just toss it to you. What was your reaction to this part of the speech? Well, a, a number of things. You know, a lot of people have focused on the fact that there were Marines standing in the background, the red lighting. We saw Darth Brandon <laughs> trending on social, uh, you know, all sorts of things. And, you know, th there are points to, to even those points, um, you know, about the the look of it, the spectacle, um, what's actually fascist, what looks fascist, and throwing that back on the shade back on the Democrats. But I think beyond that, you know, St our friend Stephanie Slade at Reason Magazine has a feature in the most recent uh, uh the most recent Reason Magazine, about the problem in, in America is not, you know, right or left being completely right or Republican or Democrat. It's the rise of illiberalism and what a threat that is to democracy. And before everybody gets mad at us out there, when I say democracy, I mean Republican democracy is understood in the United States uh, according to our Constitution and whatnot. And I don't want to have that debate right now. But that's what Biden focused on, threats to democracy, Washington Post slogan, you know, democracy dies in darkness. And their focus is MAGA, Donald Trump, of course, January 6th, which was a horrible day which they characterize as an insurrection. To me, an insurrection in, in some way has to be another state trying to take over the government and replace it. I don't think a bunch of yahoos running through the Capitol on that day, and it was embarrassing, it was terrible, I'm not trying to, to you know ignore it, but that's not exactly an insurrection. It was a riot. It was a riot in the same way that we had riots in the streets during the summer, you know, post-George Floyd and all that, and Tom Cotton wanted to de deploy troops into the streets to put down that, insurrection, as many on Fox News and Tom Cotton and others portrayed it. And I bring that up to make a point. If the problem, as Biden framed it, is threats to democracy and it challenging the way we live and our basic freedoms and our basic civil liberties and what we imagine it is to be an American, let's look at the Democratic Party for a second, because here, here is a party that, and let me preface it with this, this is a Glenn Greenwald tweet from 2020 
two weeks, let's see, October 23rd, 2020, so what, two weeks before the presidential election that year? And this is what Glenn Greenwald, who is a progressive but is a, a, a huge civil libertarian, predicted. He said, quote, if Biden wins, that's going to be the power structure. A Democratic Party fully united with neocons, Bush-Cheney operatives, CIA, FBI, NSA, Wall Street, and Silicon Valley presenting itself as the only protection against fascism. Let's think about Biden's speech on Thursday. Greenwald finished. And much of the left will continue marching behind it. Now, I think Glenn Greenwald absolutely nailed what was to come if Biden won in 2020. Does Trump represent a threat and his followers and the whole thing to Republican democracy as we understand it on some level? I think you could argue that yes, and January 6th might be a peak version of what people would worry about. Is Glenn Greenwald, was Glenn Greenwald right in his prediction? Yes. Before the 2020 presidential election, there was a story about the son of the now president, that being Joe Biden, the son being Hunter Biden, in the New York Post, one of the oldest publications of the United States, founded by Alexander Hamilton. He has a musical. Check it out. There was a story <laughs> in that publication about Hunter Biden's laptop and some questionable dealings with businesses abroad that was certainly newsworthy, certainly newsworthy given who his father is, who he is, whatnot. And as Glenn Greenwald predicted, whether it's Wall Street or Silicon Valley, who he said would work in tandem with a new Democratic administration, they suppressed that story. You couldn't read it on Twitter. It was tamped down on Facebook. And big tech decided, we don't want Trump to be reelected. We want Biden to be elected. So we're going to tamp down on this completely legitimate news story. Now, so anybody watching this right now is like, oh, Jack Hunter is being crazy. The New York Times, that radical right wing publication has since verified this Hunter Biden story. Two weeks after that, the Washington Post, another radical right-wing rag, also verified this story. So it's real. They told us at the time it wasn't, and it was pushed down. We weren't allowed to read it because they wanted a certain person to win, Joe Biden. I'm sorry, that's a threat to democracy. When this administration decides that during COVID, we this is certain things are misinformation and certain things are science. Science being the CDC and what Anthony Fauci says, and misinformation is anything that challenges that. Even if it comes comes from the scientific community, even if it comes from medical doctors, that's misinformation. That's a problem because much of that misinformation, like only N95 masks working, but not cloth masks, they don't do very well. The idea that natural immunity is a real thing. The idea that locking down schools will harm children far more than it will protect them than COVID. All of these things, which the CDC and the science have copped to at this point, was labeled misinformation at one point. We couldn't share to talk about it. You had, you had Silicon Valley, big tech, whatever you want to call that, tamping down on it being directed by the U.S. government, which this White House has admitted. Let's go one step further. Biden, the Biden administration at one point floated the idea of a disinformation governance board. What is that? Totally not fascist. Totally not or... fascist. <laughs> no, really, not at all. This is the federal government literally deciding what is true information and not true information are regulating accordingly. A clear violation of the First Amendment, of which we have because the founders feared something like a disinformation governance board. Now, I say this, Biden's speech on Thursday, he talked about, you know, MAGA and Trump and the threat to democracy, while ignoring that his own party, from a, a position of power, I would argue, higher than Trump could ever have, because he's part of the establishment, he has big tech in his ear and all the Wall Street, whatever, all these other things, that is just as threatening, if not more threatening, than anything that the Trump forces could, could threaten us with. And I don't see that discussed enough in the conversations about his speech. This is obviously the Democratic narrative going into the midterm, so they don't want to focus on Biden's record. They want to make it about Donald Trump and what dangers that could pose in the future. I mean, that's the political strategy. That's clear. But the gist of what he was saying about threats to democracy, good God, the Democratic Party poses just as much a threat as anything happening on the Republican side. Yeah, I think I have a, I had a couple big problems with this. One is the broadness of the brush with which he paints, MAGA Republicans. And he says, not all Republicans, but then he basically says, only the Republicans who work with me are the good ones. Uh, and that's not very many. Um, but also, like, MAGA Republicans, there's a lot of people that voted for Donald Trump. I do think, honestly, that there is an extreme hard right section of the MAGA movement that is kind of authoritarian, right? The, 
Trump himself is posting on Truth Social about how he's still going to be reinstated and they're going to overturn the election. Like, I do think those are that is anti-democratic. That is authoritarian. Uh, I don't think people in that vein of thought really respect the Constitution or the rule of law. Um, but I think we're painting with far too broad a brush when we assign this to all MAGA Republican. What does that mean? Everyone who voted for Trump? That's what? 70 something million Americans? 74 million plus. Easy. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, of course not. Lots of those people are, are good hearted, well intentioned uh, conservative voters. And, and I think they have a lot of respect for the Constitution and the rule of law. So that was my first problem with it. The other thing is, it's not whataboutism because we're not saying this makes him wrong, but it's just so tone deaf. To sign to say that MAGA Republicans don't respect the Constitution and don't believe in the rule of law, when Democrats and their party have increasingly just just thrown completely open in disdain. Biden himself a little bit less, but some other members of his party have openly called for packing the Supreme Court because they don't like that it strikes down uh, the things they want to do as unconstitutional. They, they have openly, many of them, praised and raised money for people who rioted in the streets, uh, destroyed p property, billions of dollars, and got people killed. Dozens of people died in the 2020 riots. And they were saying, wow, this is such a brave, <laughs> fiery, but mostly peaceful protest. Uh, and and so I can't take these people too seriously about the rule of law. And also, the, the, the whole thing about democracy, Hillary Clinton went around for years after 2016. She might still saying that she was robbed. Uh, and Stacey Abrams, who was the Democratic candidate for um, Georgia governor in 2018, she basically went on a tour saying that... Uh, the election was stolen from her, and she's a favorite of the Democratic establishment, including Biden. Biden just did something that he knew was illegal and beyond the bounds of his power. Uh, he pretty much has admitted as much and tried to unilaterally cancel student debt just with his pen and phone because he couldn't get Congress to do it. That demonstrates a clear disdain for the rule of law and the Constitution. So it's just hard. I guess... Uh, it's hard to take these criticisms from Biden seriously when he's got so much going on in his own house. But on the flip side, I also have a hard time taking some of the right wing pearl clutching, pearl clutching about the speech seriously. They're like, like I, I saw some clips from Fox or from conservative media where people were saying, how dare Biden uh, paint with such a broad a brush about groups of people and insult so many Americans and I agree, but also y'all were, were defending Trump when he said, you know, <laughs> most of the illegal immigrants coming here are rapists and murderers and some are very fine people. I don't see how that's all that different from Biden saying, you know, MAGA Republicans, not all Republicans, but MAGA Republicans are evil and fascist. Like, just the, there's a degree to which the pearl clutching on both sides about this kind of thing strikes me as insincere. Agree, and the term "whataboutism" drives me crazy because what you're basically saying when you're when you're when you're dismissing somebody by saying, "Oh, well, you're just you know committing whataboutism," is that one side is right and one side is wrong, and you're ignoring that fact. No, it's much more uh, realistic that we are human beings. This is human nature, and two sides of the coin behave in pretty identical ways. Uh, you mentioned earlier what you just said, Brad, about, you know, um, there are aspects of the right wing, right wing voters who are authoritarian. I would agree with that. I don't think the, the majority of the 74 million plus that voted for Donald Trump represent that. But on the left side, that is true, too, getting into this what about, what about oh, yeah. thing. Um, I mean, you know, you mentioned, you know, Biden thinking he could just cancel all student debt without Congress, even though Nancy Pelosi said the president can't do that just weeks before. And you need Congress to do something like that. But, you know, just in my everyday dealings, I'm, I'm in Charleston, South Carolina right now, where a lot of my friends are Democratic voters. I, I was a musician and, you know, a lot of those folks are just not Republican voters, but I see them out and about in restaurants and bars and I'll be talking to them. And I can tell you during COVID, I would talk to Democratic voters who said would say, we should round up anybody who's not getting vaccinations and force them to. And I'm like, well, that's not constitutional or moral. And they're like, well, we don't care. We're right. And, th and the basic thing that gets gets me and it relates to the rising illiberalism in the country on both left and right. You'll talk to your average Democratic voter and say, well, you know, I'm worried about free speech. And there's like, what are you worried about? I'm, I'm for free speech, too. And then I'll say, 
well, what about misinformation? They'll say, well, we can't have that. And I'll say, well, what do you do about that? Or hate, or hate speech. speech, any of that. And, and I'm like, well, you're not for free speech. And they'll argue the point. But their point is misinformation or hate speech can't be tolerated. And there needs to be an authority that decides that what that is and polices it. That's not free speech. And they can't see it. We believe what believe what we believe based on the bubbles we inhabit, whether that's right, left, center, on Mars, on Earth. I don't care what it is. I don't care if it's sports, religion, politics, whatever. But that's wrestling. wrestling. Yes, that's the most important bubble. But that's why you believe what you believe. And if you're a Democratic voter in this country and you're in the contemporary left bubble right now, you believe in a lot of things that are not liberal at all in the classical sense or the general sense. Yeah, certainly. And, and the same thing goes for political violence, because what I did and, and, and this is what I always try to do is I did not listen to Biden's speech live Thursday night. I listened to it Friday morning. So I had seen a lot of the, you know, like blowback and meltdown over it before I'd actually seen the speech. And it didn't really live up to the hype because for me, because basically most of this is things I've seen Biden say elsewhere. Sure. But I guess for a lot of people, this was just like hitting the nail on the head because when there's a speech, more people pay attention than to his tweets and statements. Uh, but one part I actually found myself nodding along to parts of this were when he condemned political violence. Take a listen to this. More and more talk about violence as an acceptable political tool in this country. It's not. It can never be an acceptable tool. So I want to say this plain and simple. There is no place for political violence in America, period, none, ever. We saw law enforcement brutally attacked on January the 6th. We've seen election officials, poll workers, many of them volunteers of both parties, subject to intimidation and death threats. And can you believe it? FBI agents just doing their job as directed, facing threats to their own lives from their own fellow citizens. On top of that, there are public figures today, yesterday and the day before, predicting and all but calling for mass violence and rioting in the streets. This is inflammatory. It's dangerous. It's against the rule of law. And we, the people, must say, this is not who we are. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, we can't be pro-insurrectionist uh, pro pro and pro-American. They're incompatible. We can't allow violence to be normalized in this country. It's wrong. So, like, I've been pretty consistent on this. That, that was my message immediately after January 6th, is I really don't believe in political violence as an acceptable form in a democratic, uh, in the terms of people control the government society. Um, and so I agree with the sentiment here, but it's just so hard for me to take it credibly from the Democratic Party right now, uh, which, of which Biden is the leader, because we just saw... Brett Kavanaugh, basically a guy showed up at his house with the intention of murdering him. And don't even get me started on the uh, congressional baseball game shooting that almost killed several Republican elected officials. Um, but it's like, there's crazy. There's always sure. crazies, right? But listen to this statistic and tell me it doesn't chill you to your core. According to polling by the Southern Poverty Law Center, which is a leftist group, 44% of young democratic men say that they totally approve of assassinating a politician who is harming the country or our democracy. I guess that would apply to a lot of mega Republicans, right? According to Joe Biden. And so I find with, with this so far gone in your own party, a, that A, it's irresponsible to talk about the other side like this when a portion of your base believes this, but B, um, it's just tone deaf, because how are we supposed to take you seriously? Well, Brad, I hate to say it, uh, and this goes back to the discussion we were having earlier about the rise of illiberalism on both the left and right, but that poll number does not surprise me. You know, I'm a little bit older than you, and when I was coming up, when I was growing up... Just a little, just, just a, a little, tad. Yeah, two or three years. 
But when I was growing up, <laughs> uh, people would say when you had a disagreement, you know, whether you're at the local bar, wherever you were, at the dinner table, you'd say, well, it's a free country. And what that meant is this is America and you're free to, to, agree, to agree to disagree, right? That's just a basic precept, the free, freedom of speech and Republican democracy. When we're at a point where, well, you're not free to disagree. In fact, we're going to have a, a government agency that decides what can be said and what can't be said and big tech deciding what can and can't be said. And people deciding that, hey, if you believe a certain way, that's violence and you're a threat to the country, you're a threat to democracy, you're a MAGA fascist, says President Biden. I'm not surprised that that many Democratic voters, you said young men, it was around 40 percent, thought you, that you could assassinate somebody who they thought was a political adversary. Um, a threat to threat democracy. threat to democracy. And we can spin that any way you want, right or left, as we've been discussing here today. But that number doesn't surprise me. And that's a new place we are in American politics, at least contemporary American politics. I don't know what's going on in 1827, but in 2022, that is a scary number to think about and sad, to be honest with you. It is sad, but, you know, folks like us are, are pretty consistent on not supporting any yes. of that on either side. So we'll continue to do that here. But now we're going to move on to something slightly lighter, but I think actually deeply cynical. And that is the uh, Food and Drug Administration under this, this administration. Um, they're moving forward with plans to censor your milk. So <laughs> uh, I don't know how you feel about this, if you're even in on the, the craze, but... You know, uh, uh, among the Gen Zs, especially the white girls and the gays, oat milk is the new almond milk. Almond milk is kind of old news. And now it's everything, oh, can I get an oat milk iced latte, right? It's like, it's a big, because dairy is so yesterday, dairy's bad for you, dairy's old news. Um, just, just like, you know how the trends are, right? It's dairy is out, fake dairy is in. Well... The FDA is considering making it illegal to, to call oat milk or almond milk milk. Uh, <laughs> and so here's some reporting from Reason. The Food and Drug Administration is likely to move ahead with wrongheaded and unconstitutional plans to prohibit producers of non-dairy milks, including almond milk and soy milk and oat milk, I would add, from using the term milk to describe their milks. Because powerful dairy interests are pushing the FDA to limit their competition. And so, of course, they've got a lawyer discussing how unconstitutional this is, but there are large and powerful groups asking for this ban, and the FDA is reportedly planning on imposing it anyway. So I guess my first question for you, Jack, is were you aware of the pressing need to get the government here solving this urgent problem? <laughs> well, first of all, I don't like milk, which my bones disagree with that decision on my part, but uh no, I wasn't aware of it, and this just sounds like classic cronyism of which the FDA has been, the, that's a lot of what they do, right? Yeah, it is. Uh, and I guess I find it, so So one thing is I really hate nanny state sure. issues, where the government's coming in and being paternalistic and protecting you from yourself because you're a stupid little pleb, is essentially the idea, the Michael Bloomberg school of political thought oh, we have to ban big soda sizes or people will drink themselves to an early grave. Well, this is America. And if I want to die of heart disease and morbid obesity, I will. <laughs> no, I'm kidding a little bit. But the, the idea here is offensive to me on behalf of Americans because Americans, you know, they're not the most informed when it comes to like asking them to name the three branches of government. But I think they know that almond milk and oat milk don't come out of a cow. What these big ag, what these big dairy companies are arguing, is that it's essentially fraud and misleading consumers to label these products milk, <laughs> as if people are so stupid that they think these are cow dairy products when they're not. Which I am sure you could find somebody with that who thinks that coconut milk is when they feed the cow coconuts and then milk it out with coconut flavored. But that person is probably five years old and also waiting for the tooth fairy to drop off their tooth, uh, money for their tooth. It's like, this is insulting that they think we need this. And it's just such bizarre priorities because the FDA literally created a baby formula shortage that's a national crisis still 
through its incompetence, and yet this is what they're working on right Can you now. imagine James Madison, other founders working on <clears throat> our governing charter, which would later be called the Constitution of the United States, and they're worried about, you know, delegation of powers and, you know, free speech and all these other things. <laughs> One of them goes, hey, what, what if people are being sold milk that's not really milk and how can the federal government like they would have thought that was the craziest thing in the world that the federal government that that would be their its role right but here we are in 2022 we're discussing this this is nothing new the fda trying to regulate and not trying regulating these things is nothing new it's another big government boondoggle it's cronyism it's the big corporations that are involved in the milk industry not wanting these other industries that are, as you note, you'd have to be really, really stupid to think that almond milk comes from a cow or these other things. What is it? Oat, oat milk? <laughs> um, it's, it's bizarre. It's insulting. It's un-American. Certainly unconstitutional, I would argue, in the large scheme of things. This hasn't been pressed in the Supreme Court, obviously. It, at the Supreme Court, obviously. But it's just stupid. This is absolutely it's stupid, also, and it hurts though, businesses that are trying to sell these products and right, rightfully called them milk, even though they don't come from cows. Yeah, uh, it's also interesting to me because this is an example of it's not even necessarily a partisan thing, right? Because one of the leading senators who is calling for this is Mike Crapo from Indiana, a Republican. I'm sorry, from Idaho, right? A Republican from Idaho which is a big dairy state, which a lot of dairy uh, companies I are based in. I wonder who his in. donors are. He has, hey! Yes, he has introduced the defending against imitations <laughs> and replacements of yogurt, milk, and cheese to promote regular intake of dairy every day act, which would force the FDA to do this and crack down on plant-based alternatives that are labeled as milk. Uh, and it's like, dude... This is so transparent donor service. And, and, and maybe it's not even donors, but it's just like constituencies sure. in his home states, like dairy farmers or voters. It might not even be about money, but it's very obviously political clientelism because there's no actual need for this. And also it's like, how can you on one hand say that you're a small government fiscal conservative Republican uh, who, <laughs> and yet also you think it's the federal government's job to promote people consuming dairy every day. Like, maybe, here's a crazy thought. People could decide that for themselves. And then, Jack, <laughs> on the other side of this, you've got Cory Booker, a progressive, very progressive Democrat from New Jersey. He joined with two of the, the lawmakers we actually like, Senator Mike Lee and a Congresswoman Nancy Mace, in, a, in writing a letter opposing this and saying this is messed up priorities. So you can people can see this even when they're when they take their partisan blinders off. It's not even that right. partisan an issue. It's mostly just a corruption swamp thing. I think I, I would totally agree. It's not a left right thing. It's where your bread's buttered thing. So if you're an Idaho representative and there's a big dairy industry there, or read between the lines as you just mentioned. I don't know how big the dairy industry is in New Jersey where Cory Booker's a representative. He is a progressive, and you know some old school progressives care about constitutional issues, i.e., the old ACLU. And we obviously know that Mike Lee and Nancy Mace are libertarian leaning, so they're going to be constitutional conservatives on something like this. So it doesn't always play out left and right. You know, everybody's threats to democracy, threats to the Constitution, blah blah blah. This is the kind of everyday threats to the Constitution that happen that right or left don't really care about unless they can own the libs or own own the right. You know. <laughs> That's their main yeah, goal. it's hard to get too up in arms over oat milk, uh, although there are probably some white girls and gays out there <laughs> who will. The, these these lawmakers don't know the beast they're awakening, but it, it's more like the principle. Sure. It, it's like the these companies have a First Amendment right to label their products as milk, it, and there is an exception to commercial speech for, like, fraud. But you can't seriously argue this is no. fraud. Come on. Give me a break. And this to me is just like, it's just another more proof that if you think the government is like hard at work with your tax dollars solving, trying to solve your problems, you are mistaken. Most of what they're doing is about their own interests or the, the special interests serving them as their clients. And and so this is to me is just another example. I, I completely agree. This is the, the people who want this uh, enforced are literally crying over spilled milk. I had to say it, Brad. I like 
what, what else could I do? Sorry. Oh, <laughs> Puns. All right. So for our next topic, we're going to talk about something that I found very interesting. Some new polling from the Cato Institute, because everywhere I've been seeing polling about how Biden's plan to illegally and unilaterally cancel ten to twenty thousand dollars in student debt, which really means transfer it to taxpayers, is super popular and gets big majorities. I've seen so many headlines about polls like this, but all these polls are very surface level. And that's the thing about polling is, is you can always get very big results at the surface level, but then the, it looks different when you peel back the layers and actually look at the nuances here. So the Cato Institute did this. They've got a great polling department over there. And they asked people if they support Biden's plan to give $10,000 in debt cancellation per borrower for earning people less than $150,000, which is very similar to Biden's plan. 64% of people said yes, because, you know, free stuff, popular, why not? Is so is Biden's agenda actually popular? Well, not once people are actually presented with the trade-offs and consequences. So here is from the polling, nearly two thirds of Americans oppose cancellation if it raises their taxes or primarily benefits higher income people. That's 64 and 68% who oppose. About three fourths, 76% oppose it if it would cause universities to raise their tuition and fees, which we all know it would. So you get as much as 65 to 76% people oppose this as soon as you just even ask them or, or make them think about the, the costs or trade-offs that obviously exist. So I guess it's not as simple as free stuff popular, huh? I, th I think that's right. You know, politically, I think this is the Biden administration going into the midterms. So what do we do? We make this about Trump and not about Biden. What else can we do? Let's do this student loan cancellation thing that we think will just be great for them politically. I think they're wrong. What you just said, it was borne out in that poll, Brad. I think once people think about it for half a second, especially average working people, people who didn't go to college or maybe did, didn't go because they couldn't afford it or paid off their child's loan or paid off their own loan. By working, I think one of the people in this conversation knows a little bit something about that, about working their way through college, working <laughs> as a security guard and taking care of that because you didn't want to have debt. You're going to be resentful. And I dare say there's probably if as many, if not more people, Americans out there who actually vote um, who might feel that way than ones who might like like this idea, which is what I think they're going for. This is definitely. Well, yeah, and a lot of the people who benefit and like it are really young people. But guess what? Young people don't vote. Right. Well, there's that. <laughs> they don't too. show up. And I would go. Maybe they're hoping this will change that. This will bribe them to get out of bed and go to the polls, but it probably won't. Well, and think about the the hefty number of people in this country who don't vote, and that's on them. That's that's their decision. And most of them, let's be honest, probably didn't seek higher education or go to school, and they're just kind of screwed and out of the equation altogether. So you know, there's many moral dimensions to this as far as well as political strategy which I think it blow up in Biden's face, according to the poll numbers you just shared. But it will only do so if people are actually made aware of the downsides. Right. And my concern is that it, that most people will never hear anything about it because the mainstream media would just parrots the White House's talking points. Yes. Like, for example, the White House has been pushing around this graph that shows something like 90% of the benefits go uh, to people under... $75,000 a year. And that's not true. That graph has been debunked by like the nonpartisan committee for a responsible federal budget who says that these numbers aren't right. Here's why they're fudged. But yet, whenever you post something about how it's mostly going to help the wealthy, the big tech is slapping a fact check on you in some cases. And then it just says, this is not true because the White House says, and it's like, so your facts are literally just the talking points that the White House sends you. And you just assume that they're true, like the 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 level of um, carrying water on this issue is really significant, and I'm afraid that people aren't going to see through the spin, and so they might support this because they don't aren't presented with those kinds. Uh, well, to get back to the conversation we've been having this entire podcast, and you said on this issue, on this issue, yes, they are just using DNC talking points. But let's go beyond that. The entire MSNBC lineup is people from the FBI and CIA. <laughs> In the Bush administration, <laughs> tell us about national security. According to what the, this is, this is rampant throughout establishment and legacy media. They just use government talking points and government figures 
to say what's right and what's wrong. And that's the, that's the news, not challenging the government. So on this issue, you know, student loans, which we're talking about specifically, it might get lost because the mainstream media just uses government talking points. But I'm telling you, they use government talking points on everything at this point. It's really sad. Yeah. Well, we don't use government no. talking points here at Base Politics, uh, but some people in our comments section do have feedback about the talking points that we do use. So let's take a minute and dive into some comments from last week episodes. So last week we talked about California instituting a $22 minimum wage and a board to set wages applied to fast food and how that might just destroy McDonald's and many other big chains. And one guy commented, I eat way too much Taco Bell for this law to pass. <laughs> God damn it, California. And I found that uh, relatable. I like McDonald's coupons go off. Some of my favorites included $2 for 10 nuggets, $1 large fry, and $1 any coffee, any size. Well, I guess that might not be the price anymore if this, this happens. But no, it certainly won't be. But what that commentator just described is my boyfriend's version of a wet dream. <laughs> so... <laughs> So Cal uh, another person commented, California is going to get a population reduction. I got news for you. They already have been. People are fleeing. Yes, they are. Uh, so that, then on our segment about uh, a, a school district that revived spanking for kids, somebody commented, this one was interesting. Uh, first, as a teacher, this commenter is a teacher, I'm disgusted that other teachers condone using corporal punishment in schools. I got into the job to help people, not hurt them. And if it became a requirement for the job, I find a new career. I appreciate that. I, I, I can see that. I think it's weird if you're a teacher who gets excited by the idea of getting to hit your kids in class. That would be a red flag for me. Um, this person also said, uh, and this was from my hot take, I disagree with your take on hunting. I don't enjoy killing animals. I've known grown men who cried over killing a deer. That's not what it's about, at least not for me and the people I know. However, I never feel closer to nature than when I'm participating in its natural cycle. There is no more fulfilling feature than, there is no more fulfilling feeling than eating a dish made of harvested game, freshly caught fish, and foraged greens that you brought from the wild yourself. It's also healthier and absent any form of artificial touch you can appreciate the majesty of nature and benefit from its fruits without any trace of irony moreover hunting is necessary there isn't a single wildlife biologist or ecologist that can frame a future in which people do not assist in the control of animal populations by hunting them i think that's some fair feedback i understand how people can feel differently about that i know i would feel wrong hunting something uh and killing it but I get why people feel differently. Funny enough, my last name's Hunter. I've never been hunting. I don't know that I could do it myself. But I, I have to say, you know, as somebody who's a carnivore and loves meat and steak and all that, me going to the grocery store and picking it up and cooking it or having somebody else cook it is less moral than somebody that goes out and does it themselves, I think. I think that comment is absolutely well, right. Like see, that's kind of what I disagree with. Doing. That's kind of... But... Also, like, why is it that you're going to, to, to hunt it and kill it yourself rather than buying it from the store? It's because part of you is, in so for some people, enjoying or having fun in the sport of killing something, which I think is I, weird. Maybe, but I, you know, the cycle of life and what the commenter said, I, there's something, you know, I'm from South Carolina where hunting is very prevalent. It's deer season. I don't know if it is right now because I'm not enough of a hunter, but... There's something about facing what you're doing. I'm going to have a venison meal, and I just killed the deer that did that. And I, I see your point, Brad, but I don't. Know, I think that's more moral than me who takes myself out of the equation completely, and I don't have to face. I just go to the grocery store. Yeah, that's interesting. So uh, we got some comments from our section on uh, hitting kids. Some more, right? You you want to kick us off here, Jack? WTF says Sweetie Spoon. There is no good reason to inflict violence on a child as punishment for anything. Another commenter says teachers these days and for the last two decades are the ones in need of spankings on average. <laughs> They've done a lot more harm than good. Uh, that one cracked yeah. me up. The one that teaches. I don't support spanking teachers, but the ones that fought to close the schools in the teachers' unions. 
are more deserving of spanking <laughs> than most that's of these a, kids. I'll just say that. That's a fair that. point. And I'll say this. And look, I'm old enough that, you know, I was spanked as a child sometimes. And I don't feel like I've been traumatized or anything. I've talked to people my age of our generation that that's been a thing. I'm not condoning it or recommending it. I'm just saying that it, it is a thing. I, the school system, especially like it is now, should not be in charge of inflicting violence on the students that go there in any way, shape, or form. Even if they deserve it or even if we decide it was a good idea, which I'm not saying it is a good idea. No, you don't send your kids there, and that's what happens with teachers. If we were in a town of 112 people, and you knew everybody, and the school had five kids, and they were acting up, you knew about it, we're not in that time anymore. Most places in America are not like that. That's a different conversation, and I think that's what people think of who still think maybe this is a good idea. That's not modern America. That's not modern public education. No, that's the need to be happening uh, without question. So... Sue says, oh, hell no. Never give them permission to spank your children. I agree. Another person commented, spare the rod, spoil the child. Yeah, okay, boomer. Yeah, no, it's stupid. I'm sorry. You can discipline your child. You can be strict. You can have boundaries. You can have limits without hitting them, especially with a rod or a belt. Right. It's even worse. Uh, I'm sorry. Boomer take, downvote, dislike. <laughs> Uh, another person commented, a woman grabbed my son's arm when he was three and told him that he was bad for playing with a toy cap gun. He did not point it at her. He did not fire it at her. He said bang while running around playing with it while I was near him, maybe 10 feet away. She went up to him, a three-year-old, grabbed his arm and said that. I probably moved the fastest in my life when I grabbed her arm and let her know in no uncertain terms that if she ever touches my son again, it would be the last time she'd ever be able to use her hand. She got the message and left us alone. Wow, that's kind of intense. But you know what? I, I can see why, like, the idea of spanking your own kids is debatable enough. But the idea of somebody else putting their hands on your child, to me, is just beyond Yes, that, that parent was absolutely right to do that. That's not another adult's prerogative to parent somebody else's children. So now on to our segment about quiet quitting, where people do the bare minimum at work, the Gen Z TikTok trend. Oh, we got some comments on that, right, Jack? Yes. Let's see. You're right. Quit. You're right. I think they're saying quiet, but it's spelled quit. You're right. Quiet quitting long term is not the greatest idea. And many people in my generation and younger just don't get it. Uh, that's people obviously commenting on work, work ethics. And the quiet quitting, as you, as you said, Brad, and you wrote about it in the New York Post in a very great article about the idea just we're going to do less and less at work and quietly quit our jobs while still receiving a paycheck. Uh, another commenter says, I want to say something. I've been watching your videos for a couple of months. I'm not a libertarian. I would consider myself a socialist. But watching you guys gave me a good perspective on what libertarians think and feel about issues and what their solutions are. I like you guys' commentary, and I think it's very entertaining and informative, too. That's very nice. I think that's very kind. And I like yeah, that. People, I appreciate yeah, that. I, I, look, we're... we're we love America. People of different perspectives can watch and enjoy and listen to each other, and that's what we do. And that's what makes this country great. We need more of that and less of less censor censor people we don't agree with. Mm -hmm. So uh, back onto the quiet quitting. Somebody said many of these companies are run by far left woke anti capitalists who prioritize increasing the company's environmental and social governance score instead of maximizing its profit and stock value. So I say good on these Gen Zers for doing the equivalent of tossing a shoe into the gears. I don't really like these kind of takes where it's like other people are doing a bad thing, so we should do it too. Yeah, that's not how I approach life. So uh, this next commentator said, workers have been getting apathetic for years. Quiet quitting is a cutesy term for a behavior that has been happening throughout job history. I'm over 40, I went through this in my early 30s. However, I wasn't a temperamental brat. My problem was I couldn't have autonomy over my work. I stopped going above and beyond and just did my job until I left for a new job. Yeah, I do take the point here that it's not a new new thing. It's just a new name that people are putting on something. Uh, that's absolutely true. But there's a little bit of a trendiness element to it that maybe wasn't there before that I think is bad. Because we can see how impressionable young people can be on these apps like TikTok. And maybe that was right in your situation, but it's probably not right in a lot of situations. And people are going to think it's the trendy thing to do because it's on TikTok with getting people billions of views. And so that's kind of my main concern. Yeah. But Jack, that's all we got. That's all we've got in the comments bag. Uh, what is your hot take? Or maybe I should go first because mine is pretty quick. But I saw a friend online and absolutely no shade to him. I, I get the hustle. But he was promoting a new brand of 
pro-life coffee. So a company that is selling coffee and marketing itself as openly pro-life. And look, I consider myself pro-life, but I just, I don't want us to be at the point where our coffee has to be branded pro-life and pro-choice. And so I, I, I hope we're not actually that divided. And that's just deeply depressing to me, that the very concept. Yes, I'm pro-life as well, but I don't need to apply that to coffee or cheeseburgers or potato chips or things like that. That just seems uh, muddying the waters. My hot take, Brad, would be, and I guess this is something that I just saw that I liked. I like movies that come out or TV shows where like really old actors that are kind of past their time or whooping ass. Like if Arnold Schwarzenegger has a new action movie and he's 85, like I want to see that. I know that's weird. There's Amazon Prime just recently released Samaritan, which is Sylvester Stallone playing a comic book character that's sort of indestructible and just beating the crap out of everybody. And I don't know much about comic books, but I really enjoyed it. So if you've got Amazon Prime, Samaritan, Sylvester Stallone, Rocky Balboa, Rambo at it again. (laughs) All right, that's take. Uh, Guys, that's it for this week's podcast. Thanks for tuning in. Like, Like this podcast, rate us and review on Apple or wherever you listen. And we'll see you all next week. In the meantime, stay base.